Good morning, everyone. Nice to be with you all this morning. Let's please rise for our opening prayer. Let us take our attention within, fold our hands in front of our hearts, and with, let's pray with all the devotion of our hearts. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Mother, Mother, Friend, Friend Beloved, God, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ Bhagwan Krishna, Krishna Mahavatar Babaji, Babaji Lahiri Mahashay, Lahiri Mahashay Swami Sri Yukteswarji, and our Guru, Paramahansa Yoganandaji, Ji, Saints of all religions, we bow to you all. Beloved God, with every powerful stroke of my prayer, I am moving nearer to thee. I shall never give up, for I know that thou art eagerly awaiting my return. Peace. Peace. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. As most of us know in Self-Realization Fellowship, we always begin our services with a period of devotional meditation. So let us assume the correct meditation posture in preparation for our meditation. Please sit with your spine erect your feet flat on the floor, shoulders held back, abdomen in, your neck in line with the spine, your chin parallel to the floor, eyes gently closed, and the gaze gently lifted to the point between the eyebrows, the seat of concentration and will in the body called the Christ Consciousness Center or Kutastha Chaitanya in Sanskrit. Keep your body fully relaxed. Take a moment to let go of all thoughts and cares and worries of our daily life. And for this brief moment, for this brief time, let us make a determination to take our attention within to the best of our ability. And to experience that inner peace, contentment, sense of security, being in that Divine Presence of God and the Great Ones. And now we will have our chant, one of the chants that our Guru Paramahansa Yogananda composed. From this sleep, Lord, will you wake, wake me, from this dream, Lord, will you wake, wake me. In thee I dive, in thee I rise. In thy sea, in thee I am born, in thee I die. To live forever in thee. This world is like a dream. Our Guru says, God is dreaming this colossal dream and we are dream images in his dream. And it is because we identify our consciousness with our dream roles that we forget our divinity, our immortality. And we become so engrossed and caught up in this dream, in this illusion, in this delusion. So in this chant, we are praying to God 
to awaken us from this stupor so that we too can enjoy the dream with him without getting emotionally entangled in the drama of life we have to of course play our roles do our duties live life to the fullest and yet at the same time be detached just like god is so from this sleep lord will you wake wake me from this sleep lord will you wake wake me from this dream lord will you wake wake me in the i dive in the i rise in the i dive in the i rise in thy seen in in thy seen in me from this sleep lord will you wake wake me from this dream lord will you wake wake me in the i am born in the i die in the i am born in the i die to live forever in me to live forever in me from this sleep lord will you wake wake me from this dream lord will you wake wake me in the i dive in the i rise in the i dive in the i rise in thy seen in the in thy seen in the from this sleep lord will you wake wake me from this dream lord will you wake wake me in the i am born in the i die in the i am born in the i die to live forever in in the to live forever in in the from this sleep lord will you wake wake me from this dream lord will you wake wake me in the i dive in the i rise in the i dive in the i rise in thy seen in me in thy seen from this sleep lord will you wake wake me from this dream lord will you wake wake me in the i am born in the i die in the i am born in the i die to live forever in me live forever in me from this sleep lord will you wake wake me from this dream lord will you wake wake me in the i dive in the i rise in the i dive in the i rise in thy see in in the in thy see in in the from the 
sleep, Lord, will you wake, wake me from this dream, Lord, will you wake, wake me in the eye I'm born, in the eye I die, in the eye I'm born, in the eye I die to live forever in Will you wake, wake?
very warm welcome to each one of you good morning nice to see you all the topic for our service today is prayer it's a very vast topic and there are so many angles one could take in talking about this subject and perhaps we'll just cover a couple of different angles there are so many other ways to approach this subject and in this topic when i came to our guru paramansa yogananda's teachings i discovered a couple of new ways of looking at prayer that i was not exposed to before i came to his teachings and we'll discuss those topics as well so what we'll do today is we'll talk about what prayer is then we'll talk about the importance of prayer why prayer is important why should we pray and then once we are convinced that prayer is a good thing then we'll talk about how to pray what are the right methods of prayer and then finally we'll discuss when to pray so what why how and when i looked up the dictionary meaning of the word prayer and it says it means that it's um, a petition to god in word or thought or an earnest request or wish and that's a common understanding of prayer isn't it there's nothing surprising about that definition but our guru paramansa yogananda ji has a completely new definition of prayer he says prayer is a demand of the soul a demand of the soul it's a very interesting definition i had never thought of prayer as such and we'll discuss as the service goes why guruji defines it as such i'll share a little anecdote that uh, happened many years ago maybe about 25 30 years ago and at that time my parents were living in the south indian city of chennai and even though i was brought up in a traditional hindu home i had a very cosmopolitan upbringing i had friends from all different religions whether they be christians and muslims and sikhs and uh, you know all the religions major religions uh, that are practiced in india and so we we always respected and loved the great prophets and saints of all these religions and but we had a special love for jesus in our home even though i was raised in a hindu family because i went to christian schools and we always had a church in the school and i had many many christian friends and i always loved that sort of environment and my mother also shared this love for jesus in fact i i should say that i her love for jesus sort of rubbed off on me as i was growing up so one day she was just sitting at home reminiscing about some past events that had happened and a thought came to her mind that she had many friends named after hindu saints and deities like ram and krishna and shiva and radha and sita and so forth and she did not know of any person who was called jesus even though we had many many christian friends in our lives so she thought it was a little odd why she didn't know of anyone by the name of jesus it was just a passing thought so you know she forgot all about it and later in the day she had to go to the market to buy some groceries so she went to this tiny shop a little hole in the wall sort of shop it had a gentleman who was selling the groceries there and he had a small a son about 9 or 10 years old who was helping him you know with the with the shop so my mother was asking for different items to purchase and in the process she struck up a conversation with this little boy and they were talking and then eventually it came time to you know make the payment and so forth and so she made the payment and then as she was about to leave she said oh by the way i never forgot i forgot to ask your name what's your name and guess what he said <laughs> jesus and my mother was so stunned she said jesus christ <laughs> and the boy said no 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 only jesus <laughs> 
So it's sweet sometimes how you know, God answers even our unspoken sort of prayers. So why is prayer important? In the ultimate sense, we are the immortal soul. We are perfect. We are made in the perfect image of God. And everything that we have ever yearned for is already within us. We don't really have to ask for anything because we are complete in our perfect state. So why do we even need to pray? Because if we are perfect and we, if we are made in the image of God, and if we are complete, why should we pray? Well, it is one thing to intellectually know that our state is perfect, that we are one with God. But until we have that realization in every fiber of our being, we are still in delusion and we need help. We need help. Life is tough, right? Life is very tough. And we need help. Until we achieve that final state of self-realization, we need help. And prayer is a method to ask for God's help. I had a, a good friend who was a direct disciple of our Guru Paramahansa Yoganandji. Her name was Mary Stockton. She just passed away about a year ago. She was 96 or 97 when she passed. And when I lived in Seattle before I entered the ashram, she was living there as well. And we developed a very sweet friendship even though we had a huge age difference. And I learned many things from her. And in one conversation I was having with her, she said, you are talking about prayer. And she said, you know, I pray all the time. And I am asking for God's help, even in little things. If I'm in the kitchen cooking something or I need a little something, I will reach out to God in my heart asking for his help. And I was quite impressed by her statement because until that time, I was, my thought was that God is running this whole show, this massive universe, and my problems are so little. I don't want to bother God you know, with my little niggles and problems. Why should I go to God? You know, he has enough trouble <laughs> keeping this creation going. So I asked Mary, I said, why do you do that? And she said two things. One is that it always makes me remember that I cannot do anything without God's help, that I am utterly dependent on God for everything. Think of it, you know, this very moment, there are so many millions of complex processes happening in our body. The heart is pumping tons and tons of blood every single day. We have no clue what's going on. We think that we are maintaining this body. You know, we are only helping God maintaining this body by eating right and exercising and all of those things, but there is an infinite intelligence that is keeping us going, isn't it? So every moment we owe it to God, we owe our life to God. So that's point number one. Point number two, she said, was it brings God into my daily life, into my everyday moments, into my mundane duties. It keeps me very connected. It's a way of practicing the presence of God. So, you know, as an example, if you're driving your car, you go into a parking lot, you're looking for a space, right? Instead of just depending on providence to give you a parking space, we can be having a silent conversation with God. Help me find a space. And I tell you, you know, whenever I have practiced this, when I remember to do this, I inevitably find a good spot pretty quickly. And if, when I, whenever I forget, it usually takes me much longer. And it's a very sweet way of bringing God into our daily life. And the point is that no matter what our profession is, what our duties are, we can find a way of bringing God into whatever activity, whether we are cooking or in the office or gardening or anything. There was a story I read one time. There were these two young children. One was about 12 years old, and he had a younger brother who was about 10 years old. And their parents had gone out of town, so the parents had left these two boys with their grandparents. 
the children's grandparents. And uh, it was uh, night time. They were about to go to bed, these two boys, in their grandma's home. And so the younger son was sitting on his bed, and he was praying aloud to God. He said, Beloved God, please give me a bicycle. Please give me an Xbox gaming console. Please. And the, young, the older son, the older brother was sitting right next to me. He says, he said, Jack, why are you shouting? God is not deaf. And the younger son said, you're right, God is not deaf, but grandma is. <laughs> so there are different kinds of prayers. You have all heard about patron saints. Patron saints is a, uh, a tradition in, in Western Christianity, I suppose, and there is a saint for pretty much every profession. And uh, it's very interesting, you know, if you look up on Wikipedia, <laughs> you will see patron saints for everything under the sun. So there's a patron saint for merchants. It's Saint Francis of Assisi. There's a patron saint for chefs or cooks, it is St. Lawrence. There's even a patron saint for computers. It's a Spanish saint called St. Isidore of Seville. And I looked up that particular uh, profession because I was a computer engineer before I became a monk. And so I was particularly interested. But to tell you the truth, I have a different patron saint for computers. You know who it is? It is Mahavatar Babaji. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. So, when I was in my profession, I don't know how I got into this habit. Whenever I had computer problems, my computer was not booting up, or one of my jobs in that profession was to, in addition to designing and writing code, uh, was to also fix code, you know, fix bugs in the software. So bugs, as you know, are when the software is malfunctioning, it's not behaving the way it should, it's crashing or it is doing strange things. And if the software is a complex software, bugs can be very difficult to fix. It's one thing to identify the bug. You know, some user may have, have a problem, and then it's even complex to reproduce it, meaning to be able to reproduce that bug on a different computer under different circumstances, and to be able to consistently reproduce. And then also, you need to be able to fix it and not break something else in the process, right? <laughs> so it can take sometimes hours, days. You know, some of you, I'm sure, are relating to this because you're software people. So I was working on this very complex piece of software, and. Um, and so from time to time, I had to fix these bugs. And I don't know how I got into this habit. I just used to close my eyes and say a silent prayer to Mahavatar Babaji before I embarked on trying to fix these the bugs. And it worked. <laughs> Every single time, I was able to get the right solution in my mind and implement it, and it worked. And once in a while, I would forget to pray. And then it would take me hours, and I would be spending fruitless hours, and then I'd say, oh gosh, I forgot to pray. And then I would just stop and pray, and sure enough, you know, I would find my solution. And even to this day in the ashram, when I have computer niggles, Mahavatar Babaji is my guru that I go to, and it still works. So the point again is that, we can find a way to connect with God and gurus, no matter what our profession. To one of the gurus, to any other saint that we feel close to, we can always approach and ask for help. So we spoke about what prayer is and why prayer is important. And now we'll talk about how to pray. You remember Guruji's definition of the word prayer, a demand a demand of the soul. And this is a key concept which was so different than anything that I had ever been exposed to until I came to Guruji's teachings. I'll read you his words. 
Guruji says, God did not make us beggars. He created us in His image. The Bible and Hindu scriptures declare it. A beggar who goes to a rich home and ask, asks for alms receives a beggar's share. But the son can have anything he asks of his wealthy father. Therefore, we should not behave like beggars. What a concept. Maybe our different upbringings have taught us that you know, we are limited, cringing mortals, and we are sinners, and we have to be on our knees and ask God for forgiveness all the time and be like beggars. Guruji is saying that's not the right concept to begin with. If you go as a beggar, you will receive a beggar's share. Go to God as a son of God or as a daughter of God and demand your divine birthright. There was a great saint in India many hundred years ago, and he went into a temple to pray. And it was off hours, so there was nobody in the temple at that time. So he just sat on the floor in front of the altar, and he was silently communing with God. After some time, the emperor of the land came into the temple, and he sat next to the saint, and he was also silently praying. After some time, the saint started laughing very loudly. <laughs> and uh, you know, the emperor really got annoyed. He couldn't stop. The saint kept, you know, he was almost like rolling on the ground with laughter. And the emperor yelled at him. He said, stop, explain yourself, otherwise I will have you executed. And the saint somehow was able to control his laughter. And he said, sire, when I saw you come into the temple, I realized who you were. You were the king of this land. And I thought to myself, my gosh, here is someone who has everything they would ever want. Money, land, power, everything that a human being would, could ever want. But when I read your mind, what was going through your mind as you were praying, you were praying to God, Lord, please help me to expand my kingdom. Please give me more wealth. Please give me whatever. And the saint said, I realize that you are not a king. You are a beggar. You are a beggar. And that's why I was laughing so hard. So you see, it's never what we possess in the worldly sense that makes us rich. It is our state of consciousness, isn't it? We perhaps know of people who are very wealthy in the outward sense, but really they are beggars in, in many ways because they are wanting more and more and more. And on the other hand, we see people who may not have as much, but they are kings because they are totally content and happy with what they have. The great Indian saint Kabir, medieval saint, he had a, a couplet. He wrote these very beautiful couplets called dohas, meaning two lines couplets. And one of them said, Jo kachu na chahi wo shahanshah, meaning he who needs nothing is the real king. He who needs nothing is a real king. So the key point here is to remember that we have to change our attitude, our consciousness from being a beggar to be a child of God. If there is one thing you want to take away from the service today, that's the key point you want to take away. Pray to God as his child, not as a beggar. Guruji says, your prayers may have gone unanswered because you chose to be a beggar. Also, you should know what you may legitimately ask of your heavenly father. You may pray with all your heart and power to own the earth, but your prayer will not be granted. Because all prayers connected with material life are limited, they have to be. God will not break his laws to justify, to satisfy whimsical desires. But there is a right way to pray. 
The secret of effective prayer is to change your status from beggar to child of God. When you appeal to him from that consciousness, your prayer will have both power and wisdom. Second point, like Guruji said, pray only for legitimate things. If every one of us in this chapel today prayed to become the richest person on this earth, it is not going to happen, right? We all cannot be the richest person on earth. Because, like Guruji says, all desires connected to material life are limited. Because God will not break his laws of creation to satisfy our whimsical desires. So, and in our heart of hearts, we always know whether what we are praying for is legitimate or not. We know our conscience tells us. So that's a, you know, we have to be reasonable with God. Be reasonable. Go to God as a child of God, and then second, ask only for legitimate things. Third point, and this is another revelation for me when I came to this teaching. How does God respond to our prayers? Guruji says, through our willpower. God responds to our prayers through our willpower. He says that in willpower lies the germ of success. In willpower lies the germ of success. What a phenomenal concept. Prayer is not a passive thing that we pray for something and we just wait for God to satisfy that prayer. We have to do our part to help God manifest that desire, that prayer for us. Guruji says, you must believe in the possibility of what you are praying for. If you want a home and the mind says, you simpleton, you can't afford a house, you must make your will stronger. When the can't disappears from your mind, divine power comes. A home will not be dropped down to you from heaven. You have to put forth willpower continuously through constructive actions. When you persist, refusing to accept failure, the object of will must materialize. In that kind of will lies God's answer. In that kind of will lies God's answer. Because will comes from God and continuous will is divine will. It's a whole new way of looking at prayer, isn't it? What Guruji has given us. It is not a passive act. And that is why in the ashram, before we begin every meeting, any new project, we will always begin with a prayer. Beloved God, we will reason, we will will, and we will act. But guide thou our reason, will, and activity to the right things that we should do. In other words, we have to do our part. We have to use our brains. God has given us a brain. God has given us reason. God has given us discrimination. God has given us will. We have to use all of those faculties and then also ask God to help guide those faculties in the right direction. And then use our will and then God can use our human will to help us manifest our prayers. I'll share a little story with you. Uh, this took place many years ago. I was uh, an engineering student in New Delhi, India. And I was in my second year. And we had this very advanced course on mathematics. It had advanced calculus and so forth. And we had this textbook that the professor was using. At the end of the textbook, there were 25 questions very difficult, that, complete the, that uh, covered the whole syllabus of that textbook. And I was just very new to Guruji's teachings, and I was getting exposed to some of these concepts of prayer and using the will constructively and so forth. None of my 
classmates, we had about 45 students in my class. None of, none of us had attempted to even look at those questions because they were very difficult. The course was difficult, the questions were even more difficult. And one day I, I was just sitting in my house and I said, you know, I'm going to try to put some of these concepts into practice that Guruji is teaching me, of praying and then using my will and reason and so forth. So I said, I'm going to start attempting to solve these problems. So I sat quietly at my desk, closed my eyes, prayed to God to help me, to direct my intelligence in the right way. And then I took the first question, and it took me a long time, a couple of hours, to crack it. And finally, I got it. And over the course of the next few weeks, I took each question systematically, and I was able to solve all of them, and to my utter surprise. And when I had all of the answers, I decided to neatly write them down on a piece of paper and, you know, several papers, several pieces of paper. And the next day I went to class and I showed it to my good friend. He and I were working on many projects together and he looked at the solutions and he said, how did you do it? Did you ask your dad? I, I, I said, no, I, I don't know. I, I just was able to do it. So he said, this is amazing, can I, can I make a photocopy of this? And uh, I said, of course, yeah, go, go for it. And in those days, you know, we used to have a photocopy shop outside the campus, a tiny hole in the wall. And you had to go there and you had to give your sheets and the fellow, there was a full-time photocopier fellow there. <laughs> and uh, he would photocopy the thing for you and, uh, you know, you had to pay him something. So my friend went to the shop and got his copy done and he returned my original to me. And I was, I was very happy that it helped him. Now, a few days later, I happened to go to that photocopy shop for some other work. And to my shock, the fellow had made stacks and stacks of my copies, and he was selling them ready-made. And to tell you the truth, I was very flattered. <laughs> and I was a star on campus, at least for a few days. But uh, the point is that all my gratitude really went to God and Gurus, because I realized that, you know, if I couldn't have solved those problems on my own if I had attempted to do them. Maybe I could have, but it would have taken me maybe twice as long. But I, you know, like Guruji says, I had to, I prayed, but then I had to use my will and intelligence. I didn't sit there and say, okay, God, now tell me what I'm supposed to do. I had to think, I had to reason, I had to put my intelligence to the utmost test, and then the solutions came through God's grace. So when do we pray? When do we pray? Guruji said, remember that behind your will is a great divine will, but that oceanic power cannot come to your aid unless you are receptive. That's the key. We have to be receptive. How do we become receptive? There's only one way. <laughs> through utter calmness. And how do we become calm? Through meditation. By using the scientific techniques that our Guru has taught us, we can calm the restless mind, calm the heart, calm the body, and then automatically we open up the channel for God's grace and blessings to come to us. God's grace is like rain. It's pouring all the time. But most of us are like closed channels. You know, it's like a, a tank. The tank is closed. No matter how much water falls on it, it's not going to get filled up. But when we become calm and receptive, we open up the lid of that tank and then the water can flow in and fill us up. So God's grace is like that. It is pouring continuously on all of us without exception, without partiality. It is up to us to become receptive and be open. The Master says, the time to pray to God for guidance is after you have meditated and felt that inner peace and joy. That is when you have made divine contact. If you think you have a need, you can then place it before God and ask whether it is a legitimate prayer. If you feel inwardly that your need is just, then pray, Lord, 
you know that this is my need. I will reason, I will be creative, I will do whatever is necessary. All I ask of you is that you guide my will and creative abilities to the right things that I should do. So, in other words, we don't want to be completely self-reliant and we don't want to be fully reliant on God and not do anything on our own. It has to be this balance. We have to use our faculties, but at the same time ask for God's help. In the material world, people forget the second part. They use their creative abilities and they think they have everything they need to be able to achieve what they want. And sure, and ultimately, we are all perfect. We have all the divine qualities within us. But when we ask for God's help, before embarking on something, during the performance of that duty, and at the end, then we become like an open channel for His grace. And then we double up. We double up our efforts automatically because God is by our side to help us. You see, God is not going to force Himself in our lives, because he has given us complete free will to do what we want. But when we ask for his guidance and his help, then he's right there to help us. Now, there's a very uh, interesting piece of research that came out some years ago, and th this was conducted by scientists, not spiritual or religious people. They researched prayer, if it works, how it works, why it works. So they divided prayer into two categories. One is called directed prayer, and the other is called non-directed prayer. So in directed prayer, the person who is praying is asking for something very specific. They're asking for, say, healing, or they have a need, they want a job, or they're praying for someone else that has a need. They are praying for something very specific. That's a directed prayer. A non-directed prayer is they don't pray for something specific. They pray for the right thing to happen, the highest, the best thing to happen. So in other words, directed prayer is, let my will be done. I am asking for something, so please give it to me. Versus non-directed prayer, which is, let thy will be done. There is a need, but I don't know what the highest thing is. You decide. God, you decide what the highest thing is, and you grant that. And what these scientists found was fascinating they found that consistently, consistently, every single time, non-directed prayer had better and more effective results. Isn't that fascinating? That's what Guruji says, right? Let thy will be done, not mine. And thou art the doer, not I. Science is finding this now, that instead of paying, praying for something specific, because in our little intelligence, our little consciousness, we do not know what the highest thing is in any particular situation. So we just place that need before God and then let God decide what the best thing is. And the highest outcome comes out of that kind of prayer. Now, of course, you know, as a child of God, we can always, as an intimate child, will ask for a father or mother for something specific. It's, it's not wrong to ask God for something specific if he wanted to. But it shows greater faith and we'll get better results by actually asking God to give us what we need rather than telling him what we need. So in conclusion, we some key points that we talked about. One, the most important, is to change our consciousness from beggar to child of God. Approach God in that state Approach God only with legitimate desires. Pray even during mundane activities. That's a way of bringing God into our daily lives. Make him or her, whatever concept of God you have, an intimate friend that you're having a conversation with all the time. The best time to pray is after meditation, when we are calm and receptive. Pray deeply and continuously with perseverance. Even if we don't find results immediately, don't doubt. Don't doubt. And don't uh, look for results all the time. Oh, is my prayer working or not? 
That is like sowing a seed and then digging it out every day to see if it is sprouting. It will never sprout. You have to sow the seed, water it, protect it, give it nutrition, and then forget it, right? Then the seed will sprout automatically. Prayer is the same. You pray, you have faith, you let it go, and then the results come in their own due course. And then we have to reason, will, and act, but ask God to guide those faculties to the right thing. And the best form of prayer, like we discussed, is let thy will be done. Letting God decide what is best for us. And of course, there's a whole different subject of praying for others that we did not even touch upon today. And that's a very beautiful use of prayer. And uh, since we won't have time today, I encourage all of you, if you want to learn more about that subject, to pick up the little uh, free booklet, Worldwide Prayer Circle, where Guruji goes into a lot of depth into how to pray for others effectively. So in closing, I would like to read this quote from our Guru. If you want to close your eyes and just concentrate on his words. Master says, in the silence that comes after meditating deeply, concentrate with unswerving will on the thought of your need. Do not keep looking for the result. Just go on praying unceasingly. Your duty is to bring your need to God's attention and to do your part in helping God to bring that desire to fruition. Let us now spend just a minute praying deeply for those in need, any family or friends that you are aware of who is in need of physical, mental or spiritual healing. Let us also pray for world peace and harmony. And then we will stand up in a minute to practice the healing technique taught by our Guru. Let us please rise. For those of you who may be new, in this healing technique, we gather the life energy from the ether, we bring it into the body through the medulla oblongata, and then we gather it in our hands by either rubbing the hands rapidly with together or by rotating them around each other and then we raise our arms to the level of the forehead and we chant Om, visualizing that energy going out of our fingertips to those in need and as we do that we lower the hands to the sides and in the last part we will pray for world peace by raising the arms to the forehead, chant Om while keeping the hands at that level during the whole duration of the chant. So let us pray together. Heavenly Father, Thou art omnipresent. Thou art in all Thy children. Manifest Thy healing presence in their bodies. Rub our hands rapidly with each other, visualizing the energy gathering there. Raise our arms. Oh. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father 
Thou art omnipresent. Thou art in all Thy children. Manifest Thy healing presence in their minds. Rotate our arms. Om. Heavenly Father, Thou art omnipresent. Thou art in all Thy children. Manifest Thy healing presence in their souls. and brotherhood Om. let us pray together heavenly father, heavenly father mother, mother friend, friend beloved god, god great gurus of self realization self saints of all religions, of all religions. we bow to you all Beloved God, may Thy love shine forever on the sanctuary of our devotion and may we be able to awaken Thy love in all hearts. Om. Peace. Amen. May God and Gurus bless us.